This is day two of the 2008 Idlewell Bible School. Our second period teacher is Brother Anthony Whitehorn. His general topic is a life worth living. Today's topic is our status. Well, good morning, brothers and sisters. Good morning. Great. Great. You know, I have to say that I come here and you teach me how to say good morning. And I come to you and I teach you what catching a crab means. <laughs> Seems like a pretty good bargain to me. And I tell you, by the end of the week, you'll all be learning and knowing how to speak English. So that's going to be a good thing. Okay? And, uh, you, you know, you had a war to get rid of us. And i am come back here to convert you. So there you go. So today, a life worth living. Our session two, our status. I, I want you to start off by, uh, I'm going to tell you two stories, and they're stories about two pictures. The first picture is um, the sort of pictures that were drawn in the 16th and 17th centuries. Um, and it was called Vanitas Art. And Vanitas Art, during that period of time, was art of still life. So it may have been uh, flowers. But somewhere in that picture, in Vanitas art, they would draw a little skull or a little hourglass. And the whole idea was, yes, to have a look at this still life, but also to be reminded that life is fragile and that life is finite. Hence the skull or the hourglass. And of course, when you think about it, that's what we talked about yesterday. That is our situation. That the cards go back in the box, that the game ends, the whistle blows, the counters go back in the bag. There's an hourglass, there's a skull on our picture. I now want to talk to you about another picture. It's a picture that was drawn by an Austrian, or painted by an Austrian artist. His name was Frederick Retsch. And the title of this picture is called Checkmate. It's a picture of two players. And these two players are playing chess. And one of the players is a young man and he is looking forlorn and upset and his head is in his hands. And the other player almost looks like a devil type of character. And it is obvious that he, with his black pieces, has just moved one of his black pieces on the chessboard and he's obviously put the other young man, into checkmate. And he's lying back, this devil type of character, and he's smiling and almost laughing because of what he's just done. This picture hung in the galleries for many years. And there was a young amateur chess player who came one day, whose name was Paul Murphy. And he came and he looked at this picture and he studied it. And he set up a chessboard in this art gallery, exactly where all the pieces on the picture were. And he looked at it and he studied it and he said, I don't believe it. This is called checkmate, he said. But actually, it's not checkmate after all. And he managed to move the pieces such that actually in four goes, the white pieces got the black pieces into checkmate. It wasn't checkmate after all, although it looked like it at the outset. You know, when David came to the big man, Goliath, it looked like checkmate, but it wasn't checkmate after all. When Daniel was thrown into that lion's den, it looked like checkmate. But it wasn't checkmate after all. 
when the man, the Lord Jesus Christ, was hung on a tree, it looked like checkmate. But it wasn't checkmate after all. Our situation looks like checkmate. But this morning I will explain to you, and you know, our status. It's not checkmate after all. Turn with me, if you would, to Peter. Because that's what, that's what we talked about yesterday, the first letter of Peter. And the way, the process, that Peter takes us through his first letter of the situation, the status, the response, the responsibilities. And this is what he says in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 18. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers. That's, that's the way, that's our situation, the, the empty way of life handed down to us from our forefathers. But with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb, without blemish, or defect. And when you have a look at that, it says there in verse 18, if you know that it's not with perishable things such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed. It's not that you will be redeemed. You, you have already been redeemed. It's already happened. That is your status. My status. It's already happened. You were redeemed. And um, that's what Paul, Paul really does. Paul really explains to us this status that we are in. The situation of the hourglass and the skull, and now he's going to take us into the status that we are really in now. You know when you have a look at certain books in the Bible, and there's certain books that you just love. I love Ecclesiastes. I love Ecclesiastes because it really tells us our situation. But in the New Testament, I absolutely love the book of Romans. Because the book of Romans really tells us our status. And when Paul, he wasn't too sure, he'd never been to Rome. He wasn't too sure as to whether he was actually going to make it to Rome. But he realised that he needed to write to the Christians in Rome. And so he almost says, I need to tell them what is crucial, what is vital. And so he tells them the gospel. And he tells them the status. That there's no personal elements in this letter to the church at Rome. It is almost like the pithy part. This is what you really need to know, you Christians in Rome, writes Paul. So let's have a look at, uh, at the letter of Romans. We're going to spend quite a lot of time in Romans to understand our status. Having appreciated our situation. Let's turn to Romans, therefore. Romans chapter 1. And uh, we're going to look at verse 18 to 20. Uh, and in my Bible, Bible, and it's I'm reading from the New International Version, it says God's wrath or wrath um, against mankind. Um, and here we go: the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. We know that passage very well. We know that this is a great passage whereby somebody says, yeah, but what about the people in, 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 who don't know about God? And of course we quote to them that verse 20, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. No one can say, 
I didn't know about God. They just have to look at the creation. But it also says that the wrath of God is being revealed. That if you are wicked, you get God's wrath. Now, God's wrath is not God's anger. That's not what it is. God's wrath is God's righteous judgment. And the Jews fundamentally thought that because they were the people who followed the law, that they were fine. And I have to say, brothers and sisters, I get a bit like that, and perhaps you do as well. You know, the Jews, they looked at the Gentiles and said, look at that bad lot out there. They're not following the law. Ha! They're condemned. And I'm a little bit like that myself. I look at other people in the world who perhaps are a little bit morally or ethically lower than me. And I'm saying, they're worse than me. I'm better than them. That's how the Jews were. Perhaps that's sometimes how we all are. But Paul goes on and says this to us in chapter 3. If you turn over the page and in chapter 3 in verse 9 he says this, to you, to me, to the Jews, to everybody. He says this in verse 9, what shall we conclude then? Are we any better? You think you're better, Anthony Whitehorn, don't you? You think you're better than some of those people out there? Well, let me tell you, not at all. We have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under sin. And so are you, Anthony Whitehorn. As it is written, there is no one. Not even one. There is no one who understands. No one. How about this? No one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good. Not even one. None of us are righteous. Not even one. So, what does that mean? Well, it means this. We are living under God's wrath. And therefore, that is you and me. We are living in a hopeless situation we are not going to make it even if you is there anybody in here who has never ever done anything wrong you're a bad lot you lot aren't you (laughs) absolutely even if you have done just one thing wrong let me tell you that's it you're finished it doesn't say God doesn't say look if you're a little bit good then that's fine. He says, no, no, you've got to be perfect because it is God's righteous judgment. And if you do just one thing wrong, you just think one thing wrong, that's it. You haven't made it. And that's us. That is our situation. And that's what Paul writes the church at Rome. Turn just forward to me, would you, um, to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2 and the first three verses. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath so we are objects of wrath because we sinned and that word sin in that first verse there you were dead in your transgressions and sin someone said to you do you think you're a sinful person you said no actually I'm quite a good person let me just explain to you what that word means that word means there is the word the Greek word harmatia and harmatia is a very simple word it means to miss the mark. 
it, you know, sin is not being really, really bad. It just means to miss the target. Just think about it. Let's supposing that you are doing some archery and you fire at the target and you miss by just that much. And the next person who comes up, he comes along and he fires at the target and he misses by a hundred yards. Actually, you've both missed the target. It doesn't say in the score sheet that, well, he missed by a long way and you missed by this little bit. It says that you both completely missed the mark. And that's what that says there. We've missed the target. We have missed life's target. And what is life's target? God made us in our image, it says. And we have missed out on our potential. When God made us, he said, that's good. But now we have missed the mark. We have missed the purpose for which we were made. Whether we like it, or not. There wasn't one of you that put your hand up and said, I've never done anything wrong. I've never thought anything wrong. I tell you what, we're all in that same boat. We've all missed the mark. How do you think God feels about that? You know, just supposing that you saved up all your money, all the money that you had and you went and bought a really beautiful car. Probably a Hyundai. <laughs> and you've got this beautiful Hyundai, okay? You've got it there. And this is all the money that you've got. And you now give this great looking car to your friend. And your friend then takes that car and he, drive, he drives it around, he, he drives it and he puts his foot on the accelerator, he screeches the tyres. Actually, he, he never cleans it out. He never actually cleans the outside or the inside. And in fact, you notice now that the scratch is all down the side and he doesn't care. He's had it a few years now and he's never ever serviced it. You saved up all of your money for that car and he's not looking after it. How would you feel? I'll tell you how I feel. I'd feel really hacked off with a person. I'd be really, really upset. How did God feel? How does God feel about hacked off? Yes, it's an English, an English expression. <laughs> okay? Um, you're learning, you see. Uh, so, God feels very upset, you would have thought, wouldn't you? Because that's how we would feel. We would feel upset if we'd got something beautiful and people weren't treating it right. What does God do? Ha! Huh. Well, our status, we've already said, under God's righteous judgment, says that we failed. We might think that we're quite good. Paul did. Paul thought he was quite good. He said, I'm blameless. I follow the law completely. And there he was on the road to Damascus in the, the brightness of the day. He would have been in the middle of the day, that bright sunlight, shining on this blameless man. But actually, the brightness of the true righteousness even outshone that. And he was blinded by it. And that's you and me. We might think that we're pretty good. We might think that actually we might even be a bit blameless. But God says, no, you've missed the mark. So what does God do? Does he say, right, I'm going to start again, you lot, you're hopeless. You've missed the mark, you, you might have even done one, just one thing wrong, but that's it, you're a failure. What does he do? Let's have a look. Turn back then to the book of Romans. Because this is what Paul writes the church at Rome. And this is what he says to them. Uh, Romans and chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, and here we are in verse um, 21. But now a righteousness from God, apart from law, 
has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This is the righteousness from God. Comes through faith in Christ Jesus to all who believe. There is no difference for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. So up until verse 23, it looks bad, doesn't it? It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's us. We've missed the mark. We are Harmatia. We've sinned. And what does God do? He says, you are justified. I, I, I have decided not to start again. I've decided to change your status. You've been justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. This is a righteousness from absolutely nothing that you and I have done. Maury said that earlier on. We've done nothing here. It is God that's done it. And so, we have been made righteous. Ooh. How do we feel about that? How do we feel? Ah, I'm a righteous person. Do we feel comfortable by that? Let me tell you, absolutely. Absolutely. You are and I am righteous. What does it mean? Righteous means to be put right with God. That's what it really means. And that is us now. We have been made right with God. We are no longer enemies, alienated, or living under God's wrath. But now we have been put right with him. We have been made righteous. And that lovely um, verse in, in James where it says, The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. I always used to worry, am I righteous? The answer is, absolutely. I have been put right with God. That's what the book of Romans tells us. But I tell you what, brothers and sisters, it is completely and utterly undeserved. It is therefore a gift. I am now living under God's grace. And it is nothing, absolutely nothing, that I have done. That's my status. I remember when I was playing golf. I'm rubbish at golf. Jeff can testify that. Play with me. And... Uh, and I'm useless. Mind you, the course that we played was not easy and the wind didn't help. It's the first time I've ever hit a ball that's gone backwards. <laughs> it went forwards first of all, but then it went backwards. And I'm hopeless at golf. And I remember, I haven't played golf very much as those people who played with me have found out. I remember the second time I played golf and I went round this course and we came to this tee. Second time I've ever played, second time I've ever been round an 18-hole golf course. We came, it was about the seventh tee. We sort of got to this tee, I put the tee down, they said to me, OK, Anthony, off you go. I put the tee down, put the ball down and looked up. There in front of me was a lake. The lake was about 120 yards long. I can hit a ball about 119 yards. <laughs> This was not going to be easy for me. So I addressed the ball and I took the shot and yes, it went straight into the lake. And um, the guys who were with me, they said, oh, don't worry about that. Take a mulligan. I said, sorry? They said, take a mulligan. I said, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't know what you're talking about. I said, it's a mulligan. He said, well, what does that mean? He said, oh, you just, you just don't, don't write it down. What, you don't write down the score? No, no, that's fine. Take it again. 
I like golf. I, all of a sudden, this is my game. This is good for me. Take a mulligan. We're not going to write it down. You know what? Life's like that when you're living under grace. And um, when you think about it, there was David. David was... If you had, and I know we shouldn't, but we do, if you had a league table of sins, okay? Adultery and murder, that's got to be pretty well up the top there. And there was David. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, I love it how the Bible says, it says, when kings go off to war, David was walking around on the top of his roof. Why wasn't he at war? And there he was, and of course, he saw Bathsheba. And he committed adultery. And we know, of course, that um, what happened in terms of having her husband killed. So he committed adultery, and he committed murder. And what does he realise? Let me read this to you from the book of Psalms. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him, and in whose spirit is no deceit. This is a man who really knew about sin. He committed adultery, he committed murder. He should be dead, but he wasn't. Because even then, he realised that he was living under God's grace. Abraham. You know, if you ever said, who's, um, who's number one in terms of works? Abraham's got to be pretty well up there, hasn't he? Let's have a look at Romans, because that's what Paul goes on to say. He says, I know what you're thinking here. In Romans chapter 4, what shall we say then? That Abraham, in Romans chapter 4, Our forefather discovered in this matter? In fact, Abraham, if in fact Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about. Of course he did, because he was good at works. But not before God. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. He had been put right with God now when a man works his wages are not credited to him as a gift but as an obligation it's something you deserve however to the man who does not work but trusts God who justifies the wicked his faith is credited as righteousness David was put right with God despite his sin. Abraham was put right with God despite his works. But what did Abraham believe? Because it says there that Abraham believed God. What did he believe? He believed that God was able to put him right in God's relationship. God had changed the status. Just as God has changed our status. We were down here. We were down here living under God's wrath. God's righteous judgment. That's where we were. God has given us an opportunity. That opportunity is over there. And all we have to do is take a step. And the simple step is, is to believe that God's grace is sufficient to save us. That's what Romans says. And it is a completely undeserved gift. It is something that we haven't earned whatsoever. God has looked at us and said, tell you what, you're not there. So I'm going to give you something that you completely don't deserve. We get a little confused between mercy and grace. 
Mercy is something that you don't get, but you deserve. For instance, if my son does something really, really wrong, and he deserves a good slapping if he wasn't so tall, and I decide that I won't slap him, I've shown him mercy. He deserved it, but actually he didn't get it. Grace is more positive than that. Because grace is something that you get, but you don't deserve. Whereas mercy is something that you don't get, but deserve. So grace is so positive. Let's turn back to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4. But because of this great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive, verse 4 of chapter 2, because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. You know, it, it was while we were still, still dead in our transgressions, Grace is almost remarkable. It's almost, I was going to say, ridiculous. Let me just explain that. When, when I was in Sunday school, um, when people used to talk about the parables of Jesus, they always used to say that the parables of Jesus were earthly stories with heavenly meanings. They're not at all. They're, they're, these, are, these are interesting stories. They're not earthly stories. Just take about uh, the, um, the workers. Those people who came at nine o'clock in the morning got paid exactly the same as those people who came at five o'clock in the evening. I tell you, if I ran my business like that, we'd be out of business in a week. That's not an earthly story. It's a ridiculous story. And what about the one that we read last night about the wedding banquet? If you have a wedding banquet and there's not enough to people turn up, do you actually go out into the road and say, do you want to come? Do you want to come to my wedding banquet? You don't do that. That's ridiculous. And what about the sower? Uh, you know, seed is very precious. It was this person's livelihood. Do you think that they just scatter it anyway? Of course they don't. They plant it properly. They don't throw it on the path. That's ridiculous. And I tell you what, a Samaritan would never ever have stopped for a Jew despite what state he would have been in and you can go through the parables and they're like that they're not an earthly story they're almost a ridiculous story and that is it it's almost ridiculously gracious it is something that we struggle to understand why is that? because our entire society is made up of getting what you deserve um, example, I say to my kids, right, if you revise really, really hard, you deserve to get a good mark in your exams. That's, that's obvious, isn't it? And it's like at work, if you do a really good job, you deserve to get a promotion or you, you deserve to get a pay rise. And it's unfair, isn't it? When someone who doesn't do a good job gets a pay rise and you don't. Or someone who doesn't do a good job um, gets a promotion and you don't. That's unfair. We work, our whole society is worked on fairness. You get what you deserve. We are getting what we don't deserve. Do you know what's incredible about this conference? Is that, and I had no idea what Jim was going to be talking about. And Jim is talking all about grace. And it came up this morning, grace. And it's now in Morris's um, uh, talk. And here, it's about grace. Don't you think that that's what God is trying to get you and me to really grasp? Because it's something completely alien to us. We, it is something that we struggle. I struggle to fully understand. It's taken me years to understand it. Because I thought that I had to try and be good to get into the kingdom. Wrong. 
I had to accept that God's grace was sufficient and there's a response then once I appreciated that and then what does then Paul go on in Romans because he's taken them through and said this is your situation you're living under God's wrath you're not going to make it you're going to die God has actually changed your status and now you can live under grace do you want that? well I'll tell you what if you do then in chapter 6 show everybody else and God that that's what you want and be baptised and that's the logic that's the process of the first six chapters of Romans so our status then our status is this what a beautiful verse this is because that's how Paul goes on in Romans chapter 8 verse 1 there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus that's what Romans says and what does it go on to say in the book of Ephesians to here in him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding we have redemption through his blood and it goes on then in Ephesians 2 it is by grace you have been not you will be you have been saved through faith and that's the trust the faith is there is the trust that grace is sufficient and this is not from yourselves it is a gift of God not by works so that no one absolutely no one can boast and, and, and what I love about how God treats you and me and we read about it in Ephesians 2 earlier on while we were still dead in our transgressions I have an older sister for those of you who have an older sister you know what it's like growing up with an older sister it's a right pain <laughs> my sister my sister she loved horse riding when I was growing up what she used to do on a Saturday morning is she used to go out and she used to go out horse riding in the morning then in the afternoon she used to come home she used to then set up little jumps all the way round the garden she used to get planks of wood and all, all these little jumps and then she used to get me to go round and jump them all and she used to time me <laughs> there's my life story okay that's what I used to do on a Saturday what a sad upbringing I had I didn't like my sister <laughs> and what I used to do is I used to in order to get her back sometimes is I used to go and find her baby bear I mean she was like 10 and she still had a baby bear so we used to call it baby bear now baby bear was just a little bear that she had and I used to get it and I used to go and hide it she used to get really upset by it I used to love that <laughs> the thing with baby bear is that baby bear um, was really old it was given to my sister when she was I don't know about two and she still had it when she was I guess about 40 no she still had it when she was about 10 um, and I, rem I remember it <clears throat> because the stuffing had come out of it and it had been badly stitched up uh, it only had one ear and it only had sort of one eye because the other eye was sort of dangling out of it um, it was an awful looking thing it was almost a scary looking thing it was ragged it completely ragged but you see, my sister didn't love Baby Bear because it was beautiful or special. But she loved Baby Bear, which made it beautiful and special. While we were yet sinners, God acted. He didn't wait for us to be beautiful. He looked at us and said, hey, your ears coming off, your eyes are coming out, your stuffing's coming out, you're ragged, you lot. While we were still dead in our transgressions, whew, while we were in a hopeless situation, while the hourglass was still on that picture, the skull was still on that picture, it looked like checkmate. 
He acted. God demonstrated his love to all of us. It's almost like it was a, a love beyond reason. There's no reason why he should have done it. He didn't look at us and say, you're beautiful, and because of that I'm going to do something. He looked at, that and, at us and he said, you're hopeless. You're living under my wrath, my righteous judgment, and you've missed the mark. Okay? I'm going to change your status. And that's what he did. He's changed our status. We used to live under God's righteous judgment. That's where we were. And under God's righteous judgment, we were failures. We were dead. But he's changed us. He's now looked at us and seen that we're ragged, seen our stuffings coming out, and he said, I can change your status if you want to. I can put you over here. You can now live under God's grace. You can have life. Our responsibility is only to believe and trust that God's grace is absolutely sufficient. And I would suggest to you that blaspheming against the Holy Spirit, what is that? That is you and me not believing that God's grace is sufficient. That God can forgive every single thing that we have done wrong. And because of that, we can live under grace. Hey, and because of that, this is absolutely a life worth living.